hope this works. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Cool. Maybe I just stand back here. And just okay, cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, Today I wanted to go ahead and I, I'm, I'm Sean Jones, I'm from Old Dominion University. I work with Michelle Weigel. Um, I also know uh, Martin Klein, he was a former student. Um, and uh, what I want to go over is a blog post I recently wrote about this concept of summarizing web archive collections in, into uh, storytelling services. And so I wanted to answer the question, where can we post stories summarizing web archive collections? And the thing is, web archive collections are invaluable, and I wasn't sure how much we were going to emphasize this uh, during this uh, during this conference, but uh, we've done it quite a bit. So thanks for paving that way for me. Um, archive web pages uh, called mementos. I'm going to use that term a couple times just to let you know. Researchers often create these collections, but then somebody comes to them later and has to use them. So the question becomes. If there are a bunch of collections about the same thing, um, how is w which one meets my needs? Which one is different from the other? Um, and so, one of our colleagues, uh, Yasmin Al Nawamani, came up with this idea along with Michelle Weigel and Michael Nelson to use an interface that people already know in storytelling services to use it to be a summary uh, visualization of web archive collections. And they just developed something called the Dark and Stormy Archives Framework. And so, thank you. And uh, so, so I'm, I'm taking over this work and basically looking at uh, what was done and try to figure out, you know, why it works and how we can make it better. And what the Dark and Stormy Archive Framework does is it takes a web archive collection and essentially finds the best links in the collection and out comes a story of 28 links summarizing that collection. In, in, in using a storytelling service. And uh, the reason this works is because storytelling, if you put links into a storytelling service, it creates social cards. And if you look at the link on the, on the left and this, the social card on the right, you'll notice that the social card on the right, it's a lot easier for you to understand what the heck it means, right? So this is the whole point that we, well, the whole reason we have social cards in Twitter and Facebook and things like that. Um, now, storytelling also works with social cards for another reason. This is a visualization technique. And the thing is, is that social cards on a platform store the same information in the same location on every card. So if you list the cards in order, you can watch the story unfold. And this particular example shows the Boston Marathon bombing, and you can actually watch the story unfold through these 28 links. There, I came out of a, a collection of many, many, many more mementos. And so then I need to ask the question of which platforms support our storytelling technique of listing things in order like this. And Storify was the one that was chose, chosen for the uh, Dark and Stormy Archives framework, but which others might be suitable replacements? And so I went through about 60 tools and found that a number of them focused on customer engagement. Um, these are curation tools, or they, they're, they're listed as curation tools, but they're not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking for something where you can put links in and get a nice listing of social cards out. And these allow you to do some curation. They allow you to create a website based on the, your curation techniques or your, your efforts, per se. Some of these tools go ahead and curate for you, which is nice, but they're really not what we're looking for. Other tools only focus on the present. They do curation, but they do curation based on a particular topic or um, something that's happening today, and then tomorrow you look at the visualization and it's changed what it is, like I have with this paperly example down here. Other tools make it difficult to share. Now, if I make an awesome um, story, tell, or story <laughs> out of a web archive collection, but I can't show it to anyone, it's not very useful. But these tools were also listed in various curation um, uh, articles and things like that. So, 
Uh, the other thing is to, to, to note is that uh, sharing is kind of a continuum. If I can only share a story with other people who have paid, that makes it more difficult for me to share them. Um, if I can only st share a story with a small group of other people who have paid, that it, there are all kinds of problems with that. So. Um, other tools don't generate social cards. In this particular case, I looked at uh, Instagram, and you can see that I kept trying to put links in there to make it generate a social card, and it didn't do a very good job, but it did an excellent job of rendering a picture of my chicken nachos. So, and still other tools actually um, will generate social cards, but, but have problems generating the cards and thus uh, won't won't work unless you have some sort of automation to help them out, but these tools don't have automation, so it requires a lot of human intervention, which makes it not suitable for the dark and stormy archives framework. And then these are a little bit more important. Remember I was talking about how the story has to flow down so that one can watch it unfold? These tools are great for going ahead and creating curated collections, but the problem is, is that they make it difficult to understand maybe where the story starts. They make it difficult to understand which direction it flows. And so, for example, Pinterest, you've got these wonderful images here. And the thing is, you can figure out that the story starts in the upper left-hand corner. But do I go down or do I go right? And once I've gone right, which, which is the next item in the story? And it makes it very difficult from a visualization perspective to figure out where I am in the story. And Google Plus makes this difficult because there's, uh, it changes the order of the cards and the shapes of the cards um, when you actually put them into the, in, into the tool. So I came down to four tools, Facebook, Tumblr, Storify, and Twitter, that seem to actually be good for this technique. With Facebook, you can go ahead and create a post, which, is a collect, which you can use as a collection, and the individual comments in the collection can be the social cards, unless you can watch the story unfold. The other thing is that uh, it, you can augment any social cards that didn't get generated, you can augment using the Facebook API. Um, Tumblr also allows one to create link posts, and link posts allow one to create social cards, and you can bound them together using a hashtag, which is specific to the blog that you have created on Tumblr. And this creates a very, very nice technique for uh, generating uh, these stories. Twitter Moments is probably the weakest tool in this set. Uh, one can go ahead and create a collection of tweets. The tweets probably had social cards, but for some reason, once you put them into Twitter Moments, uh, they don't, the social cards don't always seem to survive. But Twitter does have an API, so one can go ahead and augment these tweets with uh, pictures and things like that and basically kind of generate your own social cards if there are problems. And of course, there was Storify, which was used by the Dark and Stormy Archives framework. And so for more information, please take a look at my blog post where I go over these tools in a lot more detail. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Next up, we have Rachel King, Long Island University. Come on up. And let's see if we can get this. And um, I don't have a slide deck. I actually thought that I would be faster if I just, um, and it's not a, an incredibly visual story uh, that I have to tell. So I can continue to look at that. Um, anyway, uh, and I'm also going to be somewhat in dialogue with some of the other things that we've heard since we're wrapping up a two-day conference. And I'm just going to start by saying that I was struck yesterday, Kathleen and Nora mentioned having 70 years of experience between them. And I'm just going to start by saying I have about 20 years of experience in the worlds of journalism and libraries, and that's substantial enough. Um, and I actually have a degree in, in records, uh, archives and records management. Um, and that, that really should have been enough to prevent what I'm about to describe. Basically, I lost a story that I wrote years ago. And um, this happened last year when a, a, a website that I had written for some years ago basically scrubbed all of its content. It basically wanted to reinvent itself for a different demographic. And they decided to just get rid of the, the content for the demographic they no longer consider desirable and to really just um, erase 
what had been there before. Um, I wasn't able to find my story via the Wayback Machine, and it really got me to thinking um, how this could have happened, how I could have let this happen, and made me think a little bit more about the, um, the working conditions, the economics of being a working journalist today um, in, the, in the current environment. Um, uh, so, you know, part of the reason why this happened is because I don't really work as a journalist. I, I guess I didn't care very much about the, um, the outcome of this, uh, you know, this particular story or, you know, what was going to happen to it. The story seemed, I guess, trivial to me, and yet I did feel the loss, and it immediately made me empathize quite a lot with people who, um, whose livelihoods depend on, um, on access to archived information. And so in talking about this today, I'm thinking more um, with dodging the memory hole, the idea that, um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, information and how future generations and historians will be able to use it. But because digital information can be so short-lived, my case is an example of how within your working life as a journalism, the really day-to-day -day use of, of, of your personal archives is, is an important part of the economics of making freelancing or working in news work. Um, so I wanted to um, explore personal digital archiving, which is often cast as um, something that allows individuals to deal with the the stuff of private life and to think a little bit more about how um, working journalists actually use their own personal archives um, you know every day in their professional lives and it's it seems as if there are, there really are a couple things, you know. So, for example, when Goth when the Gothamist debacle was unfolding uh, for a couple days, the the Washington Post ran a story and described that lo loss of access to um, to clips as a journalist's worst nightmare, and that is really true. To lose your job in a labor dispute and to, then to suddenly have no evidence of what you've been doing because journalists rely so much. And again, this kind of gets into the sort of labor issues and the economics of working in journalism. They, uh, you know, they absolutely need the, those marketing tools. And then the other thing is, it makes it much easier to do your work if you can access your own personal archives, all the research that you've done, you know, um, transcripts and, um, and just having them organized properly, having them, you know, accessible and available. And so, just in ter in terms of having a historical record in the future, we kind of have to help facilitate their lives now. So it's not even just a matter of stories and making sure that those stories are accessible years from now, but also help seeing how this body of knowledge that I guess I have as a, as a librarian can help m facilitate the work that journalists are doing. So, you know, that gets into the issues of, you know, organizing and naming files, the, the metadata that allows you to find the research that you've already done so that you can very quickly know that you have reliable information that you can use again in another story. Um, and I guess what I concluded is that the current practices, which is very DIY, very much people kind of figuring out on their own how to make things work, isn't necessar necessarily serving the community well. So for an example, when I look on listservs and people are really excited about the tools that the Internet Archive provides, but what I see is a sense that this is like a magic bullet, like, oh, okay, well, I never have to think about this again because I know that my clips will always be available. And I think that's kind of the opposite of what we want to um, encourage people to think about, you know, encourage journalists to not think that preservation is easy, but that actually it's kind of messy and difficult, and that there are several things. There's not going to be a ma like a magic bullet. There isn't going to be one solution. You need things like, you need to understand that you need redundancy, you need decentralization, and you need a certain amount of um, involvement with the material. You can't just leave things and assume that you're going to be able to come back to them and that everything will be fine, as if it's a book that's just sitting on a shelf. 
So, you know, when I think of the impediments to achieving this kind of understanding, there is this, um, the kind of deprofessionalizing of the field, the way digitization, and this is one of its benefits, but also one of its downsides, that it's lowered the barrier to entry. And so, you know, in many ways this is great, but when we talk a lot about, like, getting to newsrooms and, and, and you know, even something as formal as journalism programs, that very often there are so many people outside of those formal structures and that we're not necessarily really reaching when we talk about going that sort of official route. And a lot of those people are not, don't necessarily consider themselves journalists or are not really thinking about the fact that they're writing the first draft of history and that they need to be concerned about, um, about preservation. Um, you know, so I just, I wanted to kind of um, respond to and totally endorse the idea that preservation really needs to be more a part of the curriculum in, in journalism schools in, and, um, you know, in general outreach with newsrooms. But what I will also say is that um, as a practical matter, as someone who teaches and does reference and uh, information, teaches information literacy, as a lot of, I think, the rest of you do, get, we alluded to this, it's really, it's incredibly challenging to even get a few minutes in within a jam-packed semester. When I studied journalism, it was about 20 years ago, it was really at the advent of the new media age I was not expected to be a multimedia journalist. I was not expected to really have a lot of facility outside of print. I certainly wasn't really expected to be able to, you know, build websites or shoot videos or anything like that. Um, I had only the most cursory introduction, and yet my time was absolutely packed. I, it was described as boot camp. And there was just no room really to put in anything else. And so when we start talking about, oh, you know, a one, like adding a one credit class or introducing this material, it's like I'm anticipating um, a lot of, you know, resistance. And I guess what, I, what I'm just going to say, like the final um, thought that I, that I wanted to add is just that, again, as librarians, you know, we recently ha um, had a ACRL released a new framework for information literacy. And one of the frames is that information has value. Now, it seems to me that maybe we've lost something of an opportunity because if information has value, information should be preserved. And yet preservation kind of didn't really find its way in to um, what we are teaching, I think, overall, not just in journalism schools, but just in general. And the fact that accreditation, you know, is dependent on fulfilling th this framework and teaching it. And I guess what, um, what I've done in my own practice is that I've tried really hard outside of the classroom, um, not necessarily in particular to, to journalism students, but to try to cultivate a preservation mentality in students in general, really through events, um, trying to capitalize on things like, you know, preservation week um, by, you know, doing things, you know, more and more events and things outside the classroom um, in order to cultivate a mentality which I think is lacking across the board and is making it hard for people to um, preserve their, the work that they're publishing on the web. <laughs> And last up, last up we have Dorothy Carner, University of Missouri Libraries, my colleague. And while Dorothy's coming up, I want to thank her. She has done so much work on this conference to the last few days. Big hand for Dorothy. She's like superwoman. <laughs> Thanks. I need to get to my show here. Can you, can you help me here? Yep. It's not much. Yep. Okay, thanks. 
Frederick Zarnt was supposed to be doing this. He's in your program and he's actually sitting back there, but he only came about 30 minutes ago. So we switched this off the other evening. And all I wanted to tell you was about a survey that will eventually live, the results will live on the IFLA site. It was a combination of Actually, we were redoing a survey. We, we did a, an international survey trying to find out about legal deposit laws throughout the, the world in 2015. This is an update. We learned from that. We tried to make questions a little easier and reached out to many different um, listservs and individual folks at national libraries to get some responses. It was Edward McCain, Frederick Zart, and we had a couple of other collaborators, Stephen Weber from IFLA and Olga Holowina uh, from the British Library, but um, IIPC, well, maybe, anyway, there was another institution or an organization that she was with. Okay. So Olga created the slide to tell you that there were 57 countries who completed responses. 26 of them were national libraries. But we also asked some state libraries because in Germany and in Australia especially, certain libraries collect certain things for the national library. So we had some state responses as well. I will just tell you the results of two questions because we haven't analyzed this yet. We just just completed it. But I had to pull out some data for the for the Center of Research Libraries a few weeks ago. So one of our questions was, does your country have uh, or state have a legal deposit law? And we found that, that most of them do and only a few do not of the respondents. And then question three was one of the things that we were really interested in, to find out if those legal deposits law, deposit laws now cover digital works because that has been changing over the years. And just from 2015 to 2017, we're also seeing differences. And you, you heard from, from Daniel and Stina about what is happening in Sweden, and we all think that they are the standard for everybody to look up to because other places are not quite at that place yet. But we had uh, a number of libraries who said that they actually did, the law did comply or the law did include digital products or digital collections, but as you can see over on the right-hand side, there were so many exceptions, and some, some would say, yes, we take digital collections, but only if we ask for them, or only if they're audiovisual, so there are just many, many different uh, aspects to the law. So the survey will be out sometime probably in the spring with all the results and we'll be gearing up probably to, to have another survey to follow up. We're just trying to track to see how, how things are being collected digitally and um, part of that is news, part of the websites and other things. And we'll be back to you with the results. Thanks. Getting the most data. You know, I'm not sure that we can, I can give you that information yet. Um, I, I don't think we measured that. I don't no, think you have, but, we have a way to, to quantify that. No. Uh, 
Fred Frederick, come up to the microphone. Frederick's saying that, that Denmark collects the most content? This law says collect, yeah. basically collect everything. In its law says collect everything, and they've been doing just about that for as long or longer than anybody else. Everything that relates to Denmark, though, right? Yes. Most so. laws are worded so that collect everything in country that, that originates in country. Sometimes it's easy to tell, just look for the .dk or the .us, but other times with the .com, what do you do? I don't know. So we're going we're to have to dig deeper in that. Yeah. All right, well, we are at the conclusion. Um, where did Mark go? See here? Oh, there he is. I, I just want to recognize Mark. I mean, he has been just so fabulous. <laughs> He, this guy is a gem. I mean, he, no, 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 you can't, this, you can't, you gotta let me, you gotta let me brag on you. I mean, he's got so much to do. He's doing so many things, and yet he had time to reach out and say, would you like to come to the Internet Archive and, and have Dodgy in the memory hole there? And I thought, you know, for half a second. And sure, and, and he's been a great stalwart partner all the way along. So thank you so much um, for, for letting us be here. I think it's been a great space. It's been a great experience. I want to thank Brewster also for your <laughs> graciousness. And the entire Internet Archive staff, I mean, these, you, you've got some wonderful people here. You've picked, you've picked a really great bunch of people to work with, so congratulations on that. Um, I need to remember to thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services for the grant that partially made this possible, as well as the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute, which also contributed to, to the conference, and my... Um, Partners for the grant, including UCLA Libraries and the Educopia Institute. Thank you very much. And uh, Mark, do you have anything you want to say? Thank you, Ed. I just wanted to acknowledge Ed and thank thank you for your vision, your energy, and your enthusiasm, and your your industry to making all of this happen. So thank you, thank you. And and I just I just want to say I. I I have gratitude um, I'm, uh, for a lot of things, but three things uh, right now. Or three. First of all, for BZ and Diana, uh, who were our admin staff effectively here, the first people in the morning and the last people at night. Thank you, BZ. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> the second thing I have gratitude for is the opportunity that we had to share our Temple of Knowledge uh, with all of you here and some of what we do and, and of course, the staff that works here e every day. And uh, you know, sometimes people say to me, do you actually drive? To to go to the office every day and I'm like wow what a strange question I have the opportunity to come to this place every day so there's that and the third thing I'm grateful for is that I'm grateful for the opportunity to have learned more about the work that all of you are doing and that you were able to learn from each other and that we are able to, to collectively uh, continue uh, our work together uh, as a community so thank you for that Yeah, thank you to all the presenters for bringing your knowledge and, and the work that you're doing and sharing it with us. That's really what this is about, and, and it's a, I really feel like we've strengthened our community. We've strengthened the Dodge of the Memory Hole community, and that's what this is all about. Thank you.